Welcome to the first Open Ocean Summer Seminar. I'm Dr. Katie Croft Bell, Director of the Open Ocean Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. In case you've missed our spring seminar series, we now have several of them posted online, thanks to Jenny Chow. Um, and I just posted the link in the chat. Um, so those are on YouTube. You can take a look at them at your leisure. And this morning, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brennan Phillips, Assistant Professor of Ocean Engineering at the University of Rhode Island and Director of the Underwater Robotics and Imaging Lab, also excellent disco ball maker. Brennan specializes in the development and application of novel instrumentation for oceanographic research. His laboratory has spent the last several years developing ways to lower the physical and financial overhead required to access the deep sea with the goal of creating and supporting a more widespread and empowered deep sea research community. These efforts also translate well into established engineering curricula, allowing him to achieve a more open source approach for developers and educators interested in deep sea technology. On a personal note, I've known and had the pleasure of working with Brennan for many years. And in addition to his excellence in engineering, he's also an amazing mentor and advocate for young ocean engineers. Uh, today, Brennan will speak about applications of additive manufacturing and low-cost DIY techniques for deep sea exploration. Welcome, Brennan. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bell. <laughs> um, this is really uh, fantastic to see so many friends I'm seeing signing on and, of course, many people I don't know. Um, so this is just a, a tremendous opportunity and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, to Open Ocean and the MIT Media Lab, Jenny Chow for, for hosting me. Um, you know, I, I think right now is a good time. Well, um, I'm trying to start every meeting that I have uh, with a, uh, at least a short acknowledgement of what's going on in the world. Uh, and particularly today, uh, given that there's a larger audience and, um, you know, that this is you know, uh, somewhat of a large lecture for me, I, I wanted to take a few minutes um, before I get into the ocean engineering stuff. Um, you know, I, I watched the last seminar on June 1st with Tara Roberts, and uh, that was at week one of, of the Black Lives Matter protests after the death of George Floyd. And she led the audience with a very considerate and compassionate acknowledgement of all the world, world events that were going on and, uh, you know, five breaths of silence. Um, uh, there's just so much happening between COVID-19 and the murder of George Floyd um, and now others since then, uh, and persistent examples of police brutality in this country. Uh, we are all witnessing instances of great hope and then also the revealing of deep divides and of, of hate and race in this country. Um, what I would like to say to everybody is that I, have, I would like to think that I've always led my life and professional career with inclusion, respect, and tolerance for all races, gender identity, and socioeconomic economic standing. But in the past few weeks, um, I've participated in several conversations uh, and webinars that make it quite evident that while I may hold those ideals in high regard, I and we as an oceanographic, earth sciences, and engineering community, we must do better. Um, the vast majority of us, as it turns out, including me, uh, come from a place of white privilege whether there was intentional or not. And I'm committed to changing that script and doing what I can to promote access and opportunities for black, trans, and all other race, gender, and sexual minorities in my role as a higher education professional. That all being said, I also want to disclaim and specifically recognize that the immediate issue we are reckoning with as a nation is focused on black inequality and injustice. And I don't wish to take away from that by broadening the scope of my statement. So with those uh, heavy words, uh, I will now attempt to move on to something totally different. <laughs> uh, share screen. Okay, um, so hopefully this works out fairly well. Um, uh, my talk today is focused on uh, using lightweight and low cost technologies to explore uh, the deep sea. Uh, and another way to put that would be uh, cheap and deep technologies. Uh, that's sort of the lingo that uh, is sort of being tossed around here. I think Edie Witter gets credit for that, uh, but that's really what we're talking about today. Um, my laboratory at URI, uh, as Katie mentioned, is the Undersea Robotics and Imaging Laboratory, or URIL. 
uh, please uh, visit my website. It needs a little bit of updating, but you can find a lot of papers that have been published, some videos, media links, and all that, uh, and a broader description of who's in the lab. Um, with that, uh, we have, at this point, uh, four graduate students that are working uh, in the URIL. Um, several PhDs, a mix of masters and PhDs uh, from a really diverse set of backgrounds and also Connecticut, as it turns out. Um, I have a bunch of uh, folks from there. Um, we also have a, a scattering of undergraduates that come in and out, and I'm proud to say that we're hosting a uh, NOAA uh, a, a EPP MSI uh, intern this year, um, which is uh, for minority serving institutions. So that's a really wonderful thing that we're doing. Um, it's working out really well. I'm proud to be part of that program. Uh, what our lab does, uh, we're pretty broad. Uh, we're a deep sea robotics and imaging system laboratory. Uh, so we uh, focus on all kinds of things from samplers, both on the seafloor and midwater. Uh, we have a background working in soft robotic control systems. Uh, so particularly how to control, precisely control uh, low pressure uh, seawater at depth. That's sort of this interesting little niche we've fallen into. Um, we've done a lot of work with low light cameras and that gets into uh, imaging bioluminescence and also studying biological avoidance effects from ROVs and submersibles. Uh, and the topic of today uh, is something that we've really kind of grown into, which is uh, developing and deploying low cost and simple platforms for, for, for deep sea exploration. Uh, one final thing that we work on that I'm not going to have time to talk about today at all is that we're trying to push the envelope on uh, applying fiber optic distributed sensing, which is a whole interesting topic of its own, uh, to the deep sea environment. All of this work that we do in the lab uh, is uh, applied. So we do a lot of field testing. Uh, we develop in the lab, do a little bit of work maybe with some test tanks, but then we take it out in the field. And it's usually in collaboration with other oceanographers and biologists and whatnot. Um, so usually a lot of collaborative research to try out the new tech. Um, and so we also have uh, in our hands at the laboratory a number of deployment platforms of our own. So we have ROVs and drop winches that can get really deep um, and all kinds of other things. So uh, we collaborate, but we can also take our own ship out and, and test our own things. So uh, all kinds of fun things that we're up to. Um, so preaching to the choir here a little bit, um, but I think most people know that Deep sea exploration is an expensive uh, endeavor. It's hard to get into this business. Uh, the ROVs and manned submersibles that are typically involved at exploring depths beyond 1,000 meters, just to put that benchmark out there, uh, costs you know, millions of dollars to develop and operate and maintain. Uh, and because of their scale, they typically require large ocean-going research vessels to, uh, to support them. So uh, I don't mean to uh, disparage these too much. I worked for oh, well over a decade for Dr. Bob Ballard and with Katie Croftfell, Dr. Katie Croftfell, excuse me, um, uh, running Hercules. Uh, I used to be the operations manager of that group. And so I love these ROVs and, and, and these large scale systems. I'm, uh, they, they can produce an incredible amount of data. Uh, they can uh, richly explore the ocean um, for everybody to enjoy, especially when telepresence is involved but there's no getting around the fact that it costs a lot of money to do it and the scale of everything is quite large. And so I've taken some time in the past few years with, with other folks as well to just kind of take stock of what this limits us in terms of uh, our ways to explore the, the, the ocean planet. Um, so I've developed a list of all the countries in the world actually a few years ago that actually have a deep sea environment within their EEZ as opposed to the high seas. And according to my list, um, just as you know, 70% of the earth is covered in water, about 70% of the countries on the planet have a deep sea environment in their EEZ. And then within that 70% or 69% of those countries that do have a deep sea environment of their own to explore, only a small uh, percentage, about 17% by my count, you can read the fine print, all the countries that I have listed here, have what I would consider to be internal assets within that country for scientific exploration of the deep sea. So that would be an ROV or a manned submersible or an even, even an AUV are considered as well um, as something that they could do uh, in country uh, without having to work with an outside uh, partner uh, to explore their own uh, backyard, to use that term. So uh, that's a pretty limited uh, subset of, of countries that actually have that. Um, and so that is uh, dictated really by the cost of access to, to get into the deep sea. 
Uh, right, as I mentioned before, these systems cost a lot of money and there's a large ship to run them usually. Uh, the physical size of the hardware themselves uh, itself is, is something to consider as well. Um, you know, where are you gonna tie up this awesome vessel and uh, maintain it on shore? Uh, furthering this, because, they're, because of the cost of access and the physical size problem, you end up with scheduling constraints. There's only so many people that can use these things at one time. Uh, so that's another uh, thing to bound ourselves by. Uh, and then lastly, there are certainly geographical constraints uh, of such limited and large assets to consider in terms of where they can go and, uh, and explore with. And at the end of the day, this just means less exploration is happening with less people involved. That's really the takeaway from this. Uh, this, this poor infographic that I made myself. Um, so to address this, um, it requires new technology and new methodology. Uh, and that's something that we've been doing in my lab and, and other partner laboratories uh, around the country lately. Uh, this is focused on smaller, lighter, and cheaper equipment, uh, a focus on open source development framework. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and things that are designed or just appropriate for vessels of opportunity. Uh, so the idea that uh, you could use maybe a, a small boat like the one you see pictured here as opposed to that, that large research vessel as I used as, as an example earlier. And sort of my, my motto through all of this and, and that I've really come to believe um, wholeheartedly is that new tools allow us to explore in different ways. We get to see the world through a different lens when we start working on these different uh, uh, pieces of technology. So uh, some basic examples of how I got into this in the first place. Um, back in 2014 now, about seven years ago, as a PhD student, I wanted to lead my own uh, small <laughs> research expedition that was sponsored by National Geographic in the Solomon Islands to study a submarine volcano out there. And I, I didn't have the budget, obviously, for the large ROV and, and, and ship that would be appropriate for such things. So I decided to buy a fishing reel instead and develop a platform that could be deployed off of it. It was a fishing reel that had a large capacity drum and uh, could hold something like 2,000 meters of line on it. And so this system you see here is something I created in my basement at the time. Um, it's just an aluminum frame. It's got a GoPro on it uh, in, in, a, in a, a heavy or, or deep sea housing uh, and a couple LED lights that are potted. So those were fairly cheap as well. And this system could run for about three hours at a time uh, and I could raise and lower it. I have imagery down to about 1500 meters with this system and it did pretty good. Um, we were able to do multiple deployments in one day. Um, at, at, at depths of hundreds to a thousand meters deep. Uh, and we would get little snapshots of the sea floor or video if we had the camera set up like that. So pretty decent, not too bad um, for, for, for the amount of money and, and, and uh, resources that we had there. At that same time, uh, I was collaborating with National Geographic's uh, uh, Exploration Technology Laboratory, uh, which makes the drop cam system that a lot of you may be familiar with. Uh, drop cam is, is from a broader sense, a BRUV, uh, and that term is, stands for Baited Remote Underwater Video System. So taking a camera that has some uh, program or release feature built into it so that it can come back to the surface uh, and putting some bait on it and seeing what mobile fauna will come by. Uh, and typically it's large sharks in the deep sea. So these are really good at exploring for sharks as it turns out uh, and other deep sea fishes. Um, so working with this technology, which is really good, here's an example of, I think, a six scale. You'll be able to count them in a minute yourself, uh, attacking the drop camera. You can see right down inside of it. Uh, you get some really cool videos of the seafloor. You can do habitat characterization. You can do a little bit of biodiversity work. Um, and because so many drops have been going on around the world, um, they're starting to get more of a spatial coverage, which is an interesting project of its own to discuss. So. I'm really inspired by this work because I think National Geographic really led the way by developing this self-deployable, you know, lightweight type tool that really didn't cost too much. Um, so if it's lost, it's not the end of the day. Uh, following that work, uh, I decided to make my own BRUV and they look like this now. Uh, they're a totally different approach uh, than the National Geographic drop cam. Uh, the drop cam is a very nice, integrated, very, very seamless system um, in terms of how it can be programmed and used. This is not, uh, but it's modular. So I can add things onto it as I like to, take them off. Um, and the, uh, the weight drop, that's how these things work. They're uh, dropped from the surface with a, with a releasable weight. And after a period of time, that weight is dropped and they re return to the surface. So the weight stays on the seafloor. 
floor. Um, I've set this up with an off-the-shelf acoustic release and drop weight system here. So that's, instead of having that large sphere that has all the electronics in it, I've developed this as like a modular platform that you see here. So each of these bruvs that I'm showing here, in this instance, in this image here, costs around $14,000 US uh, per unit, uh, which is still a lot of money, uh, but it's way cheaper than the millions of dollars that an ROV would cost. So we can do some limited deep sea work with this smaller system that you see right here. Also, it packs up and folds into a, uh, a checked luggage uh, form factor. So a couple of them will be able to ship this whole system anywhere in the world. So that's a nice handy feature that goes with it. All of these technologies that I've just shown you, so MyBrov, the, the real camera that you saw, and the National Geographic drop camera, are really what has empowered this larger project uh, that's in collaboration with the MIT uh, Media Lab, Open Oceans and National Geographic. And we call the project My Deep Sea, My Backyard. I'm proud to be one of the, the members of this team that, that started it and, and is still running. Uh, this project has worked on, geez, I can't count all the pilot projects they've done now, but something like three or four now um, in different countries to bring the technology uh, for exploring the deep sea, whether it's a National Ge 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 Geographic drop camera or real camera or something like that, to one of these countries that does not have uh, a deep sea asset in country, do a training uh, workshop or several, and then leave the technology there uh, after, after we leave. Uh, to be continued to be used. So uh, essentially just delivering uh, that technology and allowing the programs to persist after we leave. Um, so this program is, I, I think, really successful and has a lot of potential going forward. So um, a really cool thing to, to talk more about. But um, I think at this point, I kind of want to return back to, te to the technology and, and get a little bit more into what we've been doing in the lab uh, specifically. Um, for those uh, engineers and, and even uh, some of the scientists uh, on board today, you're probably aware that cameras and lights on these deep sea vehicles like subs and ROVs are some of the most expensive things uh, that are on the, on the, on the platform itself. Um, and many of the other components, of course, are very ex expensive, uh, largely because they have to be contained inside pressure housings. So that would be some sort of shell, usually a cylinder or a sphere, that keeps all the electronics dry and protected from, uh, from the outside pressure and seawater environment. Um, and those are made out of aluminum and titanium, stainless steel. They have to be fabricated in, in high precision uh, machine shops. So the cost of just getting any sort of electronics underwater is gonna be expensive inherently because of the way pressure housings are used uh, currently. So my question and sort of my quest in the lab for a while has been how can we leverage some advances in 3D printing and additive manufacturing uh, to solve this problem, at least for the camera and light problem, right? Um, that's something that, uh, as I said already, is a very expensive component of these systems and also quite big as well. Uh, and before I kind of go into too much more about how I'm doing it, I want to talk about the printers that I like to use. Um, my favorite one is a Formlab Stereolithography, or SLA, as the, as the acronym is, uh, printer. Uh, they have Form 2 and Form 3s, and there are some really cool companies out here that are competing with Formlabs, too, I want to give a shout out to. Um, but currently, Formlabs is really kind of the, you know, the heavyweight in this category, but there's some other really cool printers that are coming online now that, that, that are a little bit cheaper. Um, one really special thing about Formlabs printers that I didn't uh, appreciate until uh, COVID-19 hit us is that they are able to print in a biocompatible material because they can produce uh, dental appliances and surgical guides. And so they have a, uh, a autoclavable material uh, that can directly print parts. And so the image you see on the right hand side here has nothing to do with deep sea technology, um, but it's something that for about eight weeks or so, my laboratory was heavily involved in producing uh, Y splitters for ventilators here in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, to supply local hospitals with, with these uh, uh, basically glorified PVC tubes, but that are biocompatible. And they allow multiple patients to be run on a single ventilator in the uh, worst case scenario that that was required. So that's one great thing about these printers is they can produce these high precision, reliably producible parts um, that are totally sealed. And so the design that you see right here is something that we put up to the FDA for approval and we're, we're almost there. Um, even though the, uh, it may not be needed, but we've, we've been able to take it that far just straight out of the printer with that. 
But uh, that's what those printers are capable of doing. They print out of a liquid resin, a photopolymer that is selectively cured using a laser uh, inside of the printer unit. Uh, and so it kind of prints out of a bath with it. Um, I love these printers so much that I made it a task last year for some seniors in ocean engineering at URI to figure out a way to take one to sea uh, because they print out of a liquid resin bath. If they aren't kept level, the resin will spill over. Uh, and then they wouldn't be able to, A, would make a good print, and B, would destroy the machine. And so I'm so proud of my seniors. They, uh, they produced a stabilization platform for a Form 2. This is the second iteration that you see here on, on the left side of the image here uh, that was demonstrated on both the RV Endeavor, which is URI's research vessel, and the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. Uh, so they got two trips out of that, uh, successfully printing at sea uh, with this unit. Not only that, uh, but those seniors as well, I challenged them with uh, printing something useful as opposed to um, you know, a, a bath toy or something like that. I said, why don't you try to print, because I've always been interested in doing this, guys. Why don't you try to print a sphere uh, that has an O-ring uh, um, seal built into it? So directly out of the printer, print an O-ring groove, which uh, something, again, normally would be done in a high precision machine shop to make that totally smooth and sealed. Um, lo and behold, they came up with a nice design. The one you see here is about the size of a softball. So that's the largest one they could make in the, in the build volume of the printer. And they printed it at sea and then deployed it at sea with some pressure sensing electronics inside of it uh, down to 200 meters on, on the ship's CTD. So we can use this printer to do all the things I'm about to talk about that it can do, but we can also take it to sea with us and so all the development work that we do in our laboratory to prepare for going uh, out in the ocean can also be done while we're on the ocean. And so we can go more rapidly through some of these design iterations uh, by being able to take this with us. So that was a really cool project. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that O-ring sealing feature in a minute, that's, that's been uh, very enabling. Um, so cheap and deep is the topic of today, but on a slightly more expensive end of things. Uh, in collaboration with uh, my, lab at, my former laboratory at Harvard University, where I did a postdoctoral fellowship, that's Dr. Rob Wood's lab. Um, myself and, and a number of collaborators created something called the RAD sampler. Uh, RAD stands for Rotary Actuated Dodecahedron. And images are a thousand words here. You're gonna see it uh, completely encapsulate a jellyfish here. Uh, this is working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute off their ROV Ventana um, a couple years back. Uh, these are, Monterey Ambari is a world expert in, in midwater exploration. And so this is a cool way to, a new way to uh, sample midwater animals. So they were interested in this as well. Every piece you see on the RAD sampler is 3D printed, or I should say most of it is. So that's enabled by additive manufacturing. And then you may ask yourself, cool, cool device. You, you're able to surround an animal and then let it go. But what are you going to do with it? that's actually useful here. Well, where we're going with the RAD sampler is actually putting cameras uh, onto each of those panels so that we can image the animal that's in there and do in situ uh, 3D reconstruction of the animal, basically creating a digital holotype of something that might be new to science as opposed to trying to collect it because it may be just too, dip, too, too delicate to bring it back up to the surface anyways. And so the challenge there, again, cameras are uh, not only expensive, but they're quite bulky. You know, the smallest one might be the size of a soda can or so that produces HD imagery. And so my laboratory, using this awesome 3D printer that we had there that we already knew could 3D print O-ring seals, we said, why don't we try to create the smallest possible deep sea camera that could go onto the RAD sampler in multitudes, right? All those different panels, because uh, we can't buy it, so we have to make it ourselves. And so that um, has now become its own research program that called uh, DPI. So deep, obviously for going deep underwater, PI stands for Raspberry Pi, which are those uh, super affordable single board computers that um, a lot of developers and makers love to, to use these days. Uh, Raspberry Pi has come with a pretty nice uh, cell phone-like camera, uh, very small pancake lens type thing. Again, these are all uh, fairly affordable uh, electronic items. Uh, and so the idea was to take that architecture and uh, print it inside of a 3D, put it inside of a 3D printed mold that we would then fill with epoxy. And so that potted approach to electronics is something that has been done a lot for deep sea 
uh, research, but not so much for cameras. Um, and so what we were able to do uh, with DPI is the next image I think will really guide you here is create a uh, mold that also has a built-in O-ring seal uh, that allows for a glass plate, which is the viewport of that camera, to rest right over the, uh, the camera. And the internal geometry of this 3D printed mold is such that it precisely guides where the epoxy goes in and we can stop the level of the epoxy right above, right below, excuse me, where, where the lens starts, which we cannot fill with epoxy. Otherwise, we would vi violate all the optics, uh, optical design that went into it, right? It has to use air as its medium. So what we have here is this sort of hybrid housing where the, the, the board electronics of the camera are encased in epoxy. We have a very tiny minimal air volume uh, and then a normal polished glass uh, flat viewport that's placed on top of it with an O-ring seal. Um, and what's, I was surprised as well, but this worked uh, in the lab. It's worked down the past 5,500 meters and survived um, and continued to operate at that depth. And at this point, we've taken it out to sea uh, and tested it down the past 3,300 meters as well. And we've made dozens of these cameras, so they're repeatable. And they're not that hard to make. We can make one in a day or so. Um, or actually, usually we do three or four of them at a time out of the printer uh, that goes with it. So cool. Now we have a way to make our own camera. It's super small. It goes onto the RAD sampler, but it can do all kinds of other things too. Uh, that was just sort of the, the motivation to get us started here. Uh, and so now I'm going to kind of go through a menu of what else we've done with, with DPI since then. Uh, the first thing that we did is, of course, make a drop camera out of this. We wanted to replace the hero, GoPro heroes that we were using um, with, with these DPI cameras. And so uh, last year in March, I think it was, we went out um, and worked with, uh, with BIOS, the Bermuda Institute of um, Ocean Sciences, and uh, deployed a BRUV system with two of the DPI cameras on it and collected deep sea imagery past 1,000 meters uh, of cool sharks and deep sea fish. Uh, that looks pretty good. Um, this is sort of like Gamer HD. It's not as good as a GoPro, and GoPros are actually really good for their form factor, and it's not going to be nearly as good as the really expensive high-end um, cameras that you can still uh, buy for ROVs, but it's still fairly decent, um, certainly enough for uh, visual identification of what's on the seafloor. This shot right here is kind of neat uh, because it can focus right up close as well, right, like a cell phone. Uh, we can get a really nice up close view of this uh, six scale shark coming by here looking for something to eat. Um, so that was DPI drop camera or DPI bruv, however you want to call it. Um, another iteration that we have of DPI is DPI Pro, quote unquote. Um, and really that's just the same thing, but integrated into a single puck with a battery that's rechargeable. So this is essentially reproducing a, a, a GoPro, but this is super pressure tolerant and uh, far more cheap uh, to produce on our own. Um, we could also increase the battery and do a lot more with it because it's a Raspberry Pi computer. It doesn't have to just run the camera. It could run all kinds of sensors on it as well. Um, DPI Pro, as of February, uh, has worked down to 3,300 meters. Uh, this less than exciting video, though, <laughs> is, is meant to debug uh, or troubleshoot a multi-core, uh, which is the way to take uh, sediment cores in the deep sea that was malfunctioning. And so they put the DPI Pro on there, sent it down, and got a visual confirmation of, uh, of how this thing was actually misfiring at depth. Um, so that was a cool, cool application of, of, of this fully integrated standalone system uh, that goes with it. We've also demonstrated, quote unquote, DPI Live, uh, using a couple different methods. Uh, the system you see here uh, is a uh, stainless steel tube that has a battery pack built into it and three DPI cameras that are actually connected through Wi-Fi uh, into a, into a Wi-Fi router that's in a standard pressure housing. So that's that upper right-hand image. Those are the DPI uh, computers that are right on the outside of the housing. And then inside that housing is a Wi-Fi router with an antenna pointing right at them. Um, and so in this way, we were able to get uh, live connectivity to the seafloor, um, not terribly deep, but 400 meters still counts, uh, collecting uh, chemosynthetic mussels off of Baltimore Canyon. Um, this is in collaboration with Roxanne Beinart um, here at the University of Rhode Island. So that was our first foray into using DPI as a live uh, feed instrument. We've also used the same approach to um, 
to, to work on the uh, ROV Sebastian, um, which is on Schmidt Ocean Institute's ROV. Uh, and that's been down to about 1400 meters or so on the ROV as well, looking forward and providing different points of view um, on the front of the ROV. Uh, so we've done a couple different versions of that. So I think you get the idea. Once you have the architecture of this set up, it's essentially putty in your hands. You can design using the 3D printer any form factor geometry that you can dream. Uh, because it's potted, you don't have any of these pressure housing cost expenditures or cost barriers to get you there. Um, so the sky's the limit really with what we can do with it. So sort of a laundry list of what's coming in the pipe. And uh, I have more images that I unfortunately cannot share today in a public forum, but each one of these things has something more behind it. Um, the image you do see here is of a deep eye light. Um, and what we're literally doing is taking petal headlamps, which are wonderful, actually. Uh, they're super bright. Uh, they're relatively affordable. Uh, the optics are pretty good already on them. And using the same method as we use for the camera um, to produce our own deep sea lights. Um, so now we'd be able to have the lights and the camera all put together and it's one thing. Uh, deep eye live is moving on to a fishing reel, just like I did back in 2015. Um, so reaching towards this idea of live video off of a small boat using maybe a 12 volt battery total. Um, so that's coming later this summer. Um, we're moving into doing deep high stereo and then ultimately probably 3D reconstruction using these systems. Uh, and one thing I really want to get into that I think is uh, really a good fit for this stuff is biologging tags. Um, so currently, if you want to buy a video tag uh, for a shark or a whale or anything like that, uh, they're quite large and very expensive, you know, $10,000 a pop or so. Um, and we think that not only can we beat that price point, but we can also make it open source so that people can develop their own tags, um, which I think people do want to do. Uh, and of course, we can make payloads, imaging payloads for uh, size and weight optimized uh, deep sea vehicles such as UUVs, AUVs, and all that sort of thing. So we're working on all these different topics now because we figured out how to do the camera and the light in this small form factor. Um, from a broader perspective, aside from the actual specific technical projects, um, you know, sort of the question is, where do we go from here? You know, what are we going to do now uh, besides DPI? Um, and uh, I advocate that the 3D printing based methods that I've presented here, and, and there's a few more that I haven't had a chance to go into detail, uh, they allow for more people to design and build their own hardware, right? Um, we can just share files online and make them open source if people choose to do so. Um, and at that point, you can create your own thing uh, in your own lab, possibly even at sea, right? Uh, without having to work with a machine shop and that normal typical workflow. Um, and so that's, that's a new capability to the deep sea community. There will always be a place to do it the way it has been done before. But I think there's also a place as well for this new, this new sort of technique, this new approach to, uh, to creating uh, deep sea technology. Uh, because we're focusing a lot of the work on Raspberry Pi, uh, which runs on Linux, uh, that inherently is open source software architecture. So using Python and all that uh, to, push, to, uh, to push that code. And uh, all of the stuff that I've shown to you is actually physically small. And so it can be shipped and flown around the world uh, without too much expense or overhead that goes into it. So all of those attributes empower collaboration and outreach and education um, in, in, in the ocean sciences. Uh, just a few examples of how I've been doing that um, here at URI um, for, for the students that are here, that I, I kind of use them as uh, um, uh, uh, test beds for all this sort of stuff. Um, guinea pigs, that's the term I'm looking for, excuse me. Um, so last year, uh, this past academic uh, fall semester, um, I led a class of 40 sophomores uh, who designed, produced, and tested their own deep sea housings down to 300 meters. Uh, there were 13 total teams and 11 of them survived. And so these are students that walking in the door on September 1st had not used any sort of 3D CAD, like SOLIDWORKS or, um, or Fusion 360. And they learned how to do that. They learned the principles of, uh, of pressure housings and how to seal things. They learned how the printer works and how to actually produce a part using it. And then they used all those skills by the end of the semester to produce their own pressure housings that you see right here in front of you. Um, so I didn't do any of the design work on this. Those are those students doing it, which is kind of cool. Another cool thing that I love about these printers, I'm sorry to go on about them, but uh, they can produce in a wide variety of materials, including ceramic. 
And so we're using them to do things other than spheres um, and reaching towards bio-inspired housings, such as the Nautilus that you see right here. Uh, that is designed by Maddie Kistler, who is a rising junior in ocean engineering and marine biology here at URI. That is her design alone uh, coming out of the printer right there. And on the right-hand side are uh, prototype ceramic pressure housings that have been tested down to 1,500 meters deep um, pressure in our, in our lab. Uh, currently only the size of a golf ball or so, because it's the size of our, our pressure testing facility, but, uh, but they work. Um, and those were uh, seniors that just graduated this past year. So uh, what's really cool is that these are students making this stuff, not full professional ocean engineers in, in the environment. So we're able to start the process way earlier. In fact, we can even dig earlier than that. Um, last summer, we hosted a high school student. Um, this is Kareen, uh, Kareen Kwan from uh, Milburn High School in New Jersey on the right-hand side here. Uh, Kareen did a two-week internship. That's just two weeks in my lab over the summer. She made her own DPI, DPI Pro, which was then uh, deployed here in the bay, in Narragansett Bay. That's her right there running the camera uh, down to 150 feet, so about 50 meters deep or so here in the bay, the deepest point we could find. Uh, so in two weeks, she learned all of this stuff, produced her own system, and then took it out and deployed it. Um, and that is a high school junior. So very proud of her. And then the deepest deployment of DPI, right, the DPI Pro that I showed you earlier, I wasn't on that trip. Lydia Seguros here, who is a, I think, senior at Case, uh, Case Western University and also a mate intern on the RV Endeavor, which is URI's boat. Um, so she did a uh, internship this past uh, spring here on that vessel. Uh, I handed her the piece of hardware. I said, the code's kind of there. <laughs> she said, I'll try it out. And she went to sea and deployed this thing with her own code written into it um, to successfully record the video that you saw here and troubleshoot her own multi-core at sea. So I'm, I'm, I'm not making it up. It, people can make this stuff and do it themselves. Uh, and, it's, and it's happening right now. So it's, it's really cool. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to leave off and leave a lot of room here for questions. And, and I really want to thank you for the opportunity, not only to speak about my research, but to uh, express my thoughts earlier. So thank you very much, everybody.